on deck. talk a little bit about myself and then uh, talk about what the Navy is doing for you today. Uh, but the uh, Rear Admiral Butch Galaga, I am a uh, born and raised uh, in Vallejo, so a Vallejo son. Uh, and uh, coming up uh, in Vallejo uh, is a little hard uh, because uh, first generation Filipino American, so both of my parents uh, immigrated from the Philippines, but when I was four years old, my parents divorced. Uh, so I have three other siblings, so three sisters, uh, and uh, my single mother was raised in uh, the four of us, so it's pretty tough. Uh, so I do know that we were subsidized with our food. We had food stamps, that's what it was called back then, and uh, to buy certain things just to put food on the table, and it wasn't much. Uh, well, luckily, uh, when I was nine, so it was five years uh, being raised by a single mother, uh, tough to get clothes, all those things. Uh, uh, my mom remarried, and she remarried uh, someone who was in the Navy, in a submarine, stationed at Mare Island Naval Shipyard. Uh, and uh, uh, my stepdad uh, stayed in and he left as uh, chief. But one of the first things that occurred uh, uh, after they were married was we moved over to Hawaii. He's on submarines, now he's on uh, the SSPN 601 Robert E. Lee. Uh, uh, that was stationed at Pearl Harbor. So we go to Hawaii there for three years. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, but that was my first entry into the Naval Service with respect to what they do. Uh, then uh, we came back to Vallejo. He got orders back to Mare Island, Mare Island uh, at a combat systems technical school. Uh, he became an instructor down there. Uh, but it was a little different. So I left Vallejo uh, for three years, came back, and now I'm in uh, eighth grade. I lived in College Park, which is not a good place. Uh, Northern Vallejo, uh, ganged, all those things. Uh, went to Hawaii, came back, and now I'm on the uh, east side of Vallejo. So we bought a new house, uh, moved to East Vallejo. Uh, a little nicer, but different. What I mean by different is I go into eighth grade and uh, uh, I was bullied. And I was bullied because they didn't have the same clothes that everybody else had. Uh, in, in Hawaii, you wore Aloha shirts, which were cheap, and shorts, which were cheap. And that's what I had, so I'd come to school uh, and everybody else in the pants because I found out uh, quickly that uh, the school regulation is you have, you do wear pants. Uh, but all I had was a little mushrooms. Uh, so uh, went out to uh, J.C. Penney's or Kmart, got some, got some jeans, came back, and, and uh, that's what I wore. One pair of jeans, all five days. So what happens? Kids make fun of me. Uh, so I was bullied during uh, eighth grade. Uh, it, was my, uh, it was my math teacher, Mrs. Alpengate, uh, who realized that I'm actually pretty good at math. Uh, so she focused me uh, on uh, and told me that, hey, uh, you are a very bright kid. You need to focus on your academics. I think she realized that I was uh, by myself a lot and didn't have too many friends. And so she invited me to lunch, uh, to have lunch with her every day. So I brought my lunch up there and we talked and talked about math and, and academics in general. And so uh, she continued to uh, uh, reiterate with me to focus on academics. Uh, so all through eighth grade, towards the end of eighth grade, uh, people started realizing I'm, I'm 
pretty smart and I can teach them different things. So people started talking with me, uh, but still I didn't feel like I had any core friends. Uh, ninth grade, uh, in ninth grade, uh, still with Mrs. Applegate, my math teacher, uh, I also met my uh, guidance counselor, Mrs. Banks, in uh, uh, Hogan, Hogan High. Uh, at that time now, uh, my circle of friends is, is uh, uh, broadening, uh, but one of the things I refused to do is be part of a clique. Why? Because the cliques were the ones I was bullied in when I was little. So I was my own person making my own decisions. Uh, uh, she, Mrs. Banks is the one who told me, because uh, I confided in her and said, hey, uh, when she asked me, are you going to go to college? I said, I don't know because I can't afford it. My parents had told me that, hey, look, you got three sisters. We're going to pay for you. We'll help your sisters go to college and you're on your own because you're a guy. And that's how, that's, those are the rules. Um, and so I was trying to talk to my guidance counselor. I said, hey, how do I, how do I get scholarships? What can I do to go to college, pay for college? Uh, and she had sent me and gave me some uh, uh, um, some papers because there's no internet back then uh, on ROTC scholarships for the military and also the service academies. So I wasn't sure about going into the military. You know, what does that mean? Uh, my dad, the chief at this time, he left the Navy. So he left the Navy without me attending career. Uh, and at the time, he would tell me that, hey, you can make a lot more money not being in the military. Uh, but how am I going to pay for college? Uh, so she recommended that I join NJROTC in high school just to get a feel for the military. Uh, and then if you like that, you're good. No kids probably do that. So I went to NJROTC at Hogan High uh, in the 10th grade. It was too late in the 9th grade. So 10th, 11th, and 12th, I was in NJROTC. And at that point, when I felt welcome in NJROTC, I felt far, part of a team because you have these different things performance-wise, whether it be color guard, marching band, rifle team, those types of, of uh, uh, team sports uh, where you get together. So I definitely felt like it was more of a family. Uh, at this point, uh, more people wanted to be my friends because again, I could teach them academics uh, and help them with schoolwork. Uh, but I never belonged to a clique other than NJROTC. Uh, and as I progressed up, uh, my guidance counselor said, I think you ought to apply for an ROT scholarship and service academy because you have the grades. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, athletics because one of the things I think you're gonna need uh, is athletics if you wanna to go to a service academy. So uh, 10th grade, I tried out for the uh, tennis team. I was a little too small to play football uh, and basketball and never played competitive baseball. So I tried out for the tennis team and I failed. I could not play tennis uh, at that level. Uh, but uh, again, talking to my guys, counselor, I was looking at other sports. We didn't have too many sports at Hogan at the time. So she said, hey, just you know, what do you think, keep trying. So some of my friends also tried out and they failed. And so we continue to play and get better. So I made the varsity team as a, as a junior and a senior. So two years as a varsity athlete uh, uh, at uh, uh, Hogan, uh, Hogan High. Uh, the good thing uh, is, uh, again, uh, adversity. During that time that I was trying to decide what I was gonna do and applying for ROTC or the service academies, there were a lot of haters, a lot of people who kept telling me I can't. And some of them were, no kidding, supposed to be my friends. And they said, hey, why do you want to be disappointed by applying on something that you won't get into? Uh, people at NJRC even told me that, hey, John applied last year and he didn't make it. So what makes you think you're going to make it? Because he's better than you. They would say things to me uh, like that. And I'm like, man, there's a lot of people. So I, I had a little bit of self-doubt. But then again, I go to my teachers, my guidance counselor, and at the time, Commander Petty, who ran uh, the NJRC. And they would tell me, don't listen to anyone. If you believe in yourself, you can do it. You can succeed. Only you can fail. Uh, don't let anybody else drive you to that conclusion. Because they're, gonna, they're, they're telling you you can't, but in my opinion, you can. So that was my thought process, is that I control my own success. I control my own destiny. Uh, and so I'm going to continue to push I work the academics, I'm on the varsity team, I'm gonna to continue to earn that varsity letter, and I'm gonna to continue to participate in NJROTC, uh, Sea Cadets. Again, I love the fact and, and appreciate the fact that you're part of the Sea Cadets to learn that trade and that skill set to come together. Uh, and in the end, I applied to Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, and ROTC, and I got uh, I got all three. Four years college from ROTC, Naval Academy, and, and the Air Force Academy. Uh, so, uh, I will be honest with you, uh, the reason I picked the Naval Academy 
was because I'm looking at the brochures and uh, the Nail Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. I have a lot of cool pictures with water, boats, the city of Annapolis as a harbor. Uh, pretty cool town. I opened the brochure for the Air Force Academy, a lot of dry land. Uh, fields, it's all by itself in the middle of, at the time, middle of nowhere in Colorado Springs. And I'm like, oh man, <laughs> nice little Navy town, Annapolis, or Colorado Springs all by itself. So I actually picked the nail cabin uh, and went there. Uh, well, luckily, uh, got in, uh, went to the nail academy, graduated, and uh, at the time, it was Top Gun 1. It had just come out when I went into the nail academy. Uh, but again, uh, how many of you watched Top Gun 2? Yeah, excellent. <laughs> good, 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 good. Uh, so, uh, did you like it? Pretty excited about being a pilot after that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So everyone, when I showed up at Nail Academy, wanted to be a pilot. 1986, Tom Cruise, Top Gun, pilot, pilot, pilot. But I, then I found out that pilots required a nine-year commitment after you commissioned. And this guy, remember, my side picture was I need a free education and then I'm gonna bounce. Uh, so I just thought there's no way I can stay in for nine years. Uh, so I'm gonna do something else. And I picked submarines. So luckily, uh, what's interesting is even at the Nail Academy, when I told people that I wanted to be a submariner, uh, had to go through the nuclear pipeline, get accepted, all that stuff, uh, there were some people who were mentioned at Nail Academy, more senior than me, telling me, you don't want to be a submariner, there's no argument. You know how hard that is? You know, again, doubters. No, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. Uh, and uh, uh, luckily I interviewed, got in, and uh, became a submariner at the end. Uh, so my side picture being uh, getting out in five years, uh, I was happy that I, was, I got accepted, you know, went, got through the pipeline, and I was assigned to the USS Los Angeles out of Fort Harbor, Hawaii. Did a Western Pacific appointment as a junior officer. Then, the next next phase of my JO tour, we were in Mare Island Naval Shipyard because we were, we were refueling overhaul. So I'm thinking that, oh man, I'm going to my hometown, it's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna come back to my, my hometown, be with the family, be with my friends. So I come back to Vallejo, boat goes into Mare Island, and we start this refueling overhaul. Uh, and uh, what better place to get out of the Navy than your own hometown? Uh, and so we got out of the overhaul, uh, and I submitted my resignation papers. Because it's, hey, they extended me, I'm, I'm reaching my five year minimum service requirement, so I'm gonna get out. Soon as I submitted uh, my my resignation papers, it goes to the XO, it goes to the CO. Next thing I know, the chief of the boat and all the chiefs come into the JO romper room. Uh, and, I, and I'm looking around going, Cobb, what's going on? The chief of the boat, the head enlisted person on the submarine. And he says to me, look, Lieutenant, there's no way we're gonna let you leave without staying in, because we will all serve with you. And one by one, the chief's told me, Lieutenant, I'll serve with you again, you gotta stay in. Lieutenant, I'll serve with you again, you gotta stay in. Uh, so I I, uh, I give credit uh, to the chief's quarters for convincing me not to get out, but stay in for a shore duty. I had committed for a department head, but I went to shore duty, and I, they assigned me to be the U.S. Naval Academy on shore duty. Uh, it was then uh, that I married my wife, and uh, who was also from Vallejo. Uh, we go over to Shore Duty Naval Academy, uh, surround myself with a bunch of submariners, and they convinced me to sign a contract and go back to the department head. And from there, it's the people that kept me in. Uh, the people that I, I worked with, all those, uh, all the enlisted, junior uh, and senior enlisted as well, and all the officers. Uh, that I served with. Uh, but one of the things that struck me when I stayed in and I'm looking around is, hey, I don't see anyone who looks like me. Uh, and, and so how am I gonna make it up there? And once again, there are doubters. It's gonna be hard for you to make CO, man. You know, hey, XO, it's gonna be tough, it's gonna be tough. Uh, and again, some people said, hey, you're not gonna make it. You're not, you're not hard enough. You're not tough enough uh, to continue on. Uh, but. Luckily, the, the boards who selected me uh, thought otherwise, and I just continued to be in myself. Uh, and and, and uh, following uh, my department head tour, which is on an SSBN, uh, Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarine, and that's where you got this from. We use strategic deterrent patrols to make sure that our adversaries don't try to uh, start and kick off a nuclear war because we are 
We are, they cannot target us. They have no idea where those submarines are. We need to target them. Uh, after my department head tour, uh, I, I got selected to go to a place called Naval Reactors, uh, where I worked for Admiral Bowman, a four-star admiral in charge of the Navy Nuclear Propulsion Program. I was one of his technical assistants for the uh, reactor plant. Uh, after that tour, uh, they, he asked my wife, Lonnie, hey, where do you want to go? She said, Hawaii. So we got stationed, I got stationed at Exo on uh, USS Cheyenne out of Pearl Harbor. So I went from the USS Los Angeles, the very first Los Angeles Classics Aviation, Fast Tech Submarine to the latest and greatest Los Angeles Fast, fast Tech Submarine, the uh, Cheyenne, with all the new gear. We got some cool special sensors that we deployed in the Western Pacific with, figured out how to execute tactics with that new gear, and then came back. Uh, after that, I came back to uh, Washington, D.C. to work manpower policy with the nuclear program to include reenlistment bonuses for officers and enlisted. Um, so that was that was pretty fun. I got some manpower piece out of that, trying to understand how you how you recruit, uh, how many uh, how many nuclear officers do you need coming in to the submarine force, the aviation? Because believe it or not, aviators are commanding officers of aircraft carriers, and it kind of makes sense. But they have to be nuclear trained for those nuclear reactors on those aircraft carriers, as well as the service nukes who operate uh, that reactor on that carrier. Uh, after that tour. Uh, they asked Lonnie again, hey, where do you want to go, Lonnie, for command? And then, boom, uh, we picked Charlotte. She says, Hawaii, we get to USS Charlotte out of Pearl Harbor. The beauty about Charlotte was it's one of those special boats. It has this mini submarine mm -hmm. that can attach to it. We're actually deliver seals clandestinely uh, to our enemy shores so we can do God's work and then come back and come back without anyone knowing they were ever there. Uh, that's, what, that's the capability that Charlotte had when we deployed to the Western Pacific. Uh, and coming back. Uh, after that, I became the uh, prospective commanding officer instructor. So I taught the future commanding officers and executive officers of the submarine force. Uh, then I was selected to go back to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and that's what this badge is for. Uh, I served with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in his program and budget analysis division. So what does that mean? That means that I took a look at all the services, the Air Force, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, and the National Guard, and took a look at what they needed to fulfill the requirements of, in the joint war fight. We took a look at the joint war fighting concepts, figured out how they fit in, and made sure that their resources, their budget, supported the chairman's, the chairman's joint war fighting concept. If not, we cut it. We cut it. So sometimes they call me the Grim Reaper because I was taking money from the various services. Uh, but I protected the Navy. I protected the Navy. So that's all that matters in my mind. Uh, after the joint staff, uh, Tour, I then became a uh, Commodore, which is an uh, I'm 806, and I became a Commodore of Submarine Development Squadron 12. So instead of having one submarine under my command, I had nine fast stack submarines with special gear uh, for tactical development that, that deployed up north uh, in the northern Atlantic against Russia, uh, and also Fifth Fleet against Iran and what was going on in the Middle East. Uh, a couple of my boats went under the ice to the Indo-Pacific Command to go up against uh, Russia and China. Uh, then came through the Panama Canal back to Groton, Connecticut. Uh, so that was a pretty uh, phenomenal tour. After my major command tour, I go back uh, to DC and get selected to be a congressional liaison uh, with Congress. So that, uh, as an 06, uh, work in the budget side of, of Congress and make sure that Congress funds what we would like, uh, we would like them to fund working directly for the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations. I made flag there, and my first flag tour was Undersea War Fighting Development Center again in Groton, Connecticut, uh, the uh, submarine capital of the world. That's where our training centers are, and that's where we developed the new tactics with all the new gear that we have in our submarines. Virginia class, Sea Wolf, uh, Columbia, the, the next SSBN. Uh, additionally, what uh, the tactics and capability that we put on our guided missile submarines, the SSBNs, which are converted ballistic missile submarines, so they're really big. Uh, and big enough to carry, when you convert them, 156 Tomahawk cruise missiles, 156, along with up to 60 Special Operations Forces. So we could do dual drive charges, so dual mini-sub operations with 60 SEALs, or 60 Special Operations Forces on board that uh, SSGN. So talk about capability, going up close to personal in a stealthy manner against our adversaries. That's what SSGNs were all about. Uh, but that's what uh, uh, we did at the, uh, when I made flag 
uh, and undersea warfare and all this other stuff. The beauty about that job is then I go over to Submarine Group 7 in Japan and I operate all the submarines in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific arena. So we're talking North Pole, Russia, North Korea, China, all the way down to Australia. All those operations of submarines, I got to own that, along with the P-8s, the maritime patrol aircraft, and the destroyers assigned to me to do anti-submarine warfare. Now, swing over uh, to Fifth Fleet, I also own in uh, the Indian Ocean submarine operations, again, the undersea warfare with the P-8s, the, the, the cruisers, and the destroyers assigned to me, as well as the submarines all along the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. And that's when we started watching what China was doing over there in Northern Africa, uh, where they would go uh, to and from uh, their homeland of the People's Republic of China. Uh, so all that capability in Japan, the op submarine operations, I was loving and enjoying as one star. I made two star, uh, and then I get the interview with the secretary and the CNO again, and they select me to be the chief of legislative affairs. My current job, I got there earlier this year. Working directly with Secretary Del Toro, who focuses people, and the CNO, uh, uh, who uh, focuses people as well as readiness, capability, and capacity. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is uh, where I'm coming from. And I'll quickly go through what your Navy is doing today for you, which I think would be uh, a pretty good update. Based on trade to and from various areas, our economy definitely uh, is based on our exports. And 90% of all exports go via the sea, because it's cheaper. Uh, and they can fit it on a lot of things, on the containers, on the ships. So all of those things you see, these are the key areas, and the circles are the choices that we need to make sure uh, remain open. Uh, and because uh, we believe in a rules-based international order to maintain the sea lines of communications, to maintain open and free trade, to maintain the world's economy. Additionally, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the internet. So there are undersea cables that connect the continents so that we can have real-time data transfers via the internet, right? So all that time you surf Google, it could be going through some of these submerged cables. And who protects those, those submerged cables? Because again, the data that goes through there, financial, banking, uh, all those types of information flows through those cables. So who protects them? The United States Navy. We absolutely know where those cables are, and we need to make sure our adversaries don't try to do something uh, with those cables, whether it be tracking them, pulling them up, because we, those cables are buried, and we need to make sure that uh, they remain buried. Uh, and not uh, exploited by our adversaries. So that's the United States Navy. We call it seabed warfare, making sure that we can protect those vital communication links that, again, directly affect uh, our economy. Next. So uh, I like showing this slide because this shows our, uh, our four deployed big decks. What I mean by big decks was carrier strike groups that have that air wing to do God fitting and bring and mass forces as required. Our job is to deter conflict and respond to crisis. And then if called upon in conflict to win our nation's wars. So that's why we have our big decks for deployed. Ronald Reagan out of Japan, uh, the America, uh, a helicopter assault ship out of Sasebo, and then Tripoli, a helicopter assault ship that's deployed right off of the Philippines. George W. Bush, Watching Ukraine, we absolutely are watching to make sure that Russia stays contained in the Ukraine fight. And you know, uh, just based on the news, that we flow a lot of ammunition, a lot of information over to Ukraine to help them push back uh, on the uh, on the Russians during that conflict, get them back to where they need to be. The Kearsarge uh, landing ship dock, again, showing presence up there in the Ford and ready standby off of the East Coast along with Abraham Lincoln getting ready to deploy and surge as required. Uh, so we have our big decks out there. So on a typical day, we have about 300 ships in our inventory, 105 are deployed at any given day, underway at sea, uh, getting ready to defend our nation. Next slide. So now here you have an F-18 Hornet, 
Top Gun 2, the Super Hornet is what was featured there. But we also here have two Hornets and then two Hornets. Fifth gen, uh, very stealthy uh, fighter planes that really are sensors. They have a lot of capability on that fifth generation to be a forward deployed sensor that no one can see on radar. So we would deploy them out uh, first. They provide a lot of information to us uh, in a stealth fashion. And then we can bring in the Super Hornets that have a lot more, that are heavy, heavier, have a lot more bombs and missiles on board the F-18 to take down our adversaries. And, and we continue to uh, execute flight operations on the big nets that are deployed and out in some time. Next slide. Uh, influence, we talked about maintaining a rules-based international order for to maintain freedom of navigation in the seas. So here is a US ship, US ship, uh, U.S. ship here, and U.S. ship, uh, US ship here, and that is a, a PRC China uh, Russian ship that's trying to cut us off. What they're trying to do is prevent us from in international waters. We go. You've heard about going through the Taiwan Straits and maintain freedom of navigation through the Straits. The PRC is trying to cut us off, choke us off, so we no longer go through those Straits. And if that's the case, then they can claim it as their waters, as their territorial waters. So we maintain a 12 nautical mile baseline and everything else is international waters, so we will continue to go through there. But as you see, they try to get us off course, they try to hit us and impact us, so then they will claim, in my opinion, if that ever occurred, they will claim that it's our fault, that we should not have been operating there. Now what amazes me is when you see these pictures, the individuals that are standing off of the deck and controlling where their ship goes, it's not the commanding officer, it's that junior officer, Lieutenant, Lieutenant JG level, that is there on the bridge making those decisions in that, those tight spaces with the commanding officer providing oversight. But that's what I love about the Navy is early on when you join, you're in a leadership position making these types of strategic decisions for the nation. But uh, it's a global competition against Russia and China uh, and we provide the positive influence around the world to again maintain freedom of navigation and our sea lines communications uh, open uh, throughout. Next slide. Integrated deterrence. I've talked about the SSBN and those missiles and their continental ballistic missiles in there uh, as a nuclear deterrent. We will never, our, our, uh, uh, our strategy is never to be a first strike mission. So we will never be the first ones to shoot a nuclear weapon. However, our adversaries have no idea where our ballistic missile submarines are. So if they, they ever execute a first strike, we will always be able to take them out with the second strike capability. And that's why it's important to maintain uh, this capability in a, stealth fashion, in a stealth fashion. The next generation of SSPN is, is the Columbia class which is the number one Department of Defense acquisition program to make sure that we maintain this strategic deterrent. Next slide. Allies and partners, uh, one of the things we want to do and, and one of the uh, main tenets of the national defense strategy is integrated deterrence. So what does that mean? Uh, that means if we ever go into conflict, we plan on having it uh, executed all domain fight. That's space, uh, that's uh, uh, Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, that's cyber, that's air, uh, that's surface, that's subsurface, and seabed warfare uh, as required. It'll be an all-domain fight along with our allies and partners. So what we are doing with our integrated defense is we want to bring in the allies and partners and integrate them into our conflict so we can rely on them, which means we have to train them to our state of readiness to our tactic level so that we can trust that they will execute the war plan if called upon. And being able to pull in the allies and partners, you can see how that's a force multiplier. We may only be able to deploy 100 ships on any given day, but if you pull in our allies and partners, that will surge 250 ships quickly worldwide. And that's the goal with integrated deterrence. Not just rely on the US only, but pull in our allies and partners so in 7th Fleet, before I left Yakuzka, we were constantly doing exercises with the South Koreans, the Japanese, uh, Philippines with the Marine Corps, because uh, they have no submarines, uh, and Australia, getting them into the fight. Uh, so allies and partners, uh, 
uh, again, key strategic advantage in the long term against our near peer adversaries, which is the, which is the PRC, China, uh, and Russia, because they don't have the same type of allies and partners uh, that we can rely on in, in time of conflict. Next slide. Uh, and uh, campaigning forward, again, for deploy, that's what we do. We don't want to have, uh, we don't want to be the home team in conflict. We want to keep them away from the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. We want to fight forward. So we are, we play an away game. So, we, so the soundbite is campaign forward, push our allies uh, to help us and we will support them and back them up. But we want to fight in the away game, away uh, from the United States. And uh, our war fighting advantage, I mean, look at that big carrier. But I'll tell you, our number one war fighting advantage is our people. We need people who can think outside the box, outthink, innovate faster than our adversaries. And that's what I love about uh, where we are. We are all volunteer force, uh, and we have the best and the brightest people uh, in our military uh, who can innovate, think out of the box, do things differently than our adversaries. Our adversaries uh, don't have the freedom maneuver that we have uh, in our United States Navy. They have a strict command and control structure and big boss here has to okay what this commander does. That's not how we work uh, in the United States Navy. That commander, that O5, who is in command of that ship, that submarine, they get to make the decisions, the tactical decisions on how to position and the tactics to execute. They do not need permission. It's called mission command. They'll give a mission to execute which may be take out the adversarial uh, uh, submarines, service ships, aircraft, and they just go out and execute. The, the PRC, as well as the Russians, they, they have specific guidance that they cannot de uh, alter from unless they get higher ups permission to do so. So as long as they stay constrained in that, in my opinion, we will always be able to outmaneuver them just based on our mission command construct. So I love showing this picture because the big carrier, the bunch of, of aircraft on board that can carry a lot of weapons, but really the war fighting advantage is our people. Next slide. And here's Secretary Carlos Del Toro. Uh, he always asks me to emphasize that he cares about the people. People are his number one priority. CNO, people, and his major tenants uh, with where we want to go with the Navy. Focus on the people and take care of the people uh, is uh, the key fight there because they understand, the two highest individuals in the United States Navy, understand that people are our asymmetric advantage. Next slide. Uh, service warfare, you see that, uh, you know what we do, uh, taking out the service combats and protecting the, the care strike group. Next slide. Undersea warfare submarines, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, stay stealthy beneath the sea, inside the first island chain, which is uh, near and around Taiwan. Submarines are gonna get it done. Uh, even against all those uh, near peer competitors, we still have the uh, advantage in the undersea domain and uh, we are striving to maintain that advantage. Next slide. Air warfare, again, Super Hornet, uh, Joint Strike Fighter, sensor, uh, I think the Joint Strike Fighter is a forward deployed sensor, very stealthy, they can't detect it, and then coming behind it is the F-18 Super Hornet with the, with the massive amounts of ordnance on board. Next slide. Special Warfare SEALs, I talked about how they get delivered, they could be delivered by submarines in a stealthy manner, they can parachute in, uh, they take care of business uh, on an adversary's land and then come back out and nobody knows that they were there. They just take care of business. Next slide. Uh, explosive Ordnance Disposal, a little known area of capability in the Special Operations uh, realm. And they take out uh, the bombs, the uh, uh, they can go in there and uh, breach things, uh, mass effects uh, on communications sites. So they work, again, explosive ordnance, uh, defeating it uh, or inserting it. Next slide. Information warfare, uh, intelligence, uh, they fit in here. I love talking about cyber. If you're a cyber warrior, you'd be in the information warfare realm. Uh, and uh, quite honestly, I kind of wish cyber was available when I was coming in, because I'm very intrigued, the internet didn't exist back then. Uh, but uh, we talked about the communications cable, everything goes through the internet, you have a bunch of apps on your phone. Uh, the uh, cyber 
uh, mission forces, they do offensive cyber, getting in and, and massing effects uh, via the cyber world, uh, which is coding, uh, or defensive cyber, which is protecting our networks. Uh, and then we will, uh, you know, we will train you to do either or, uh, because what we found out is you need to maintain that skill set. If you're, if you're offensive cyber, you'll always do offensive cyber. If you're defensive, you'll always do defensive because that's, it's a different kind of skill set for both. Um, I was uh, honored to enlist someone into the Navy who's gonna be a cyber, uh, cyber warrior. Uh, he's gotta go to boot camp, make it through, but he seems like a really sharp guy. What I loved about it is I was very impressed uh, because he got a $25,000 bonus uh, to enter the cyber world. Uh, and uh, when I became a, a nuclear submariner, my bonus was 2,500. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. and so I definitely appreciate uh, this time today and now I just want to answer questions any questions that you may have uh, but I wanted to touch base with you tell you where I'm coming from I am, this, I am a son uh, of Vallejo uh, and I love coming back here uh, today uh, to interface with you and let you know that uh, hey I love this area I'm coming back uh, I was on the Los Angeles to the refill and overhaul when Mare Island Naval Shipyard was attacked, unfortunately, and I saw the capability of that shipyard, and then I saw the talent leave it when it was on the wreck was still crushing blow because uh, it was my hometown. Uh, but I love seeing the uh, military sea lift command ships that are there now being repaired. It's not like on like a 90-day cycle. And the Frank Cable, one of the submarine tenders that I operated as Submarine Group 7 uh, with respect to contested logistics, and having to go forward to deploy. The submarine tenders are one of the ships that we're gonna have repair uh, our surface ships and submarines in a conflict. Uh, so what I was able to do was send the Frank Cable over to Australia uh, to come alongside, have, bring a Collins class diesel submarine from Australia alongside, so allies and partners, building that capability. I had an anchor in Palau and brought a US Navy service ship there. Uh, and we went up to uh, uh, Busan to work with the South Korean submarines to again bring them alongside to build, build that allies and partners capability. Uh, so I love the fact that I heard, just heard this week, that the Frank Cable is coming back to Mare Island Naval Shipyard to do another quick repair period and then back out to Southern Fleet. Uh, so that capability still exists, uh, but not in the scale that we had it when I was here as a young lieutenant uh, back in 93 and 95. Uh, but with that, I open it up to any questions. Or you can stay seated. Yeah. Um, trust is indispensable to uh, any leader, and it's often said that it's far easier to destroy than it is to create. That being said, how, as a leader, uh, do you build trust with uh, your constituents, the people you work with, the people who work under you? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, uh, let me tell you how uh, uh, I do it. One of the things uh, is having a conversation with everyone. Getting to know me, right? Because what uh, uh, what I found uh, uh, going through is, hey, if people join the Navy for different reasons. Remember, I joined the Navy just for a free education, and I didn't plan on staying in. Uh, and quite honestly, when I was a junior officer in the beginning, uh, yeah, you could tell that I didn't want to stay in. Um, but I did my job. I did my job. But some of the stuff that people were telling me didn't motivate me. So really, I thought, you know, why would you even say that to me? Why are you treating me that way? So one of the things that I did when I was junior officer is I, I just treated everyone with respect uh, because that's how I wanted to be treated. It's one of those things uh, that uh, was a little different because a lot of the other junior officers were, hey, if the, if the department was coming down on you, guess what you did? You just passed it down, right, through the lowest level, just continue to just beat down on the people, beat them into submission is what I would call it, but that's not me. Uh, so building trust is absolutely uh, correct. All you needed to do in my opinion, was one time jump over, jump all over someone, and then they lost faith in you. So, uh, uh, the way I do it is, again, have a conversation, meet with everyone, uh, and let them know, more importantly, let them know what you're thinking, what's in your head. Uh, so these are the three tenants uh, that uh, I have in my command today. It's a little different. Uh, well, let me do two things. One, I'll tell you how I started out as a junior officer in department head. These were the three things that I asked my division and my department to focus on on a daily basis. 
First thing I said was, hey, integrity first. I need you to be honest with me whenever you tell me something and to yourself with respect to your capabilities. If you don't think you're capable of executing this procedure, don't try it. Just let us know. I promise I'm not going to yell at you. That's okay. We'll just give you the skill set. Maybe you'll be under instruction this time, so you'll build up that proficiency. Uh, but I don't want you to do something that you're uncomfortable with. Uh, but I need you to be honest with me and tell me those things. Uh, two, procedural compliance. Everything we have has a procedure. You've got to be able to follow that procedure. And, but if you can't, then let me know about it. Again, I need you to be honest with yourself on whether or not you can execute it. And then uh, we'll put the system in a safe condition and then we'll figure out the way ahead with respect to executing this uh, procedure that's, if it's required. And the last thing is I want everyone to remember that we are a team. We back each other up. We build a deep bench so we have that ready spare. If somebody gets injured, we have somebody else who can come in and finish the play. That type of discussion, that was, that's, what, that's what was in my head. That's how I think about my division and my department. And it served me well uh, because they knew. And they'll test you. They'll come with you with some bad news and see what you do about it. Okay, sir, you said that you want them to be honest. So I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, hey, sir, this just happened. I screwed this up. Now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to yell at them? Is that okay? I'm not going to tell them bad news anymore. I'm like, okay, let's go figure this out. So we get the chief and, and then we figure out, hey, how to fix it. Chief, my, chief Kento was awesome. My second chief, he was kind of mean. Uh, so I'd say, Chief, Chief, okay, one, don't yell at him. Don't yell at him. We'll figure it out. It's okay. Brad, he screwed it up. I know. But he didn't. It's not like he woke up every mo this morning and said, I'm going to screw something up. But I, uh, I truly believe that people don't wake up in the morning wanting to screw something up. Uh, so what you need to do is really look at yourself in the mirror and say, how did I not enable this individual to succeed? It's kind of interesting to try to tell a Chief that. And a lot of them will say, what are you talking about? It's his fault. Uh, but really, the way I did it, I took it center of mass and said, hey, it's my fault because I did not train him well enough uh, to execute that plan. So having that conversation. I'll tell you now, at this level, because I have so many people working with so many efforts, different areas, uh, and I'm definitely not a micromanager. And this is how that goes. Uh, when I was XOCO and above, it was, I trust those in the trenches. So I'm going to trust what you have to tell me, so I need you to tell me the truth. You know, be honest with me and yourself. Two, fearlessly communicate up and down chain. When I have something in my head, I will let you know. I will tell you what's in my head. And then if it doesn't check with what you think, because something's different, I need you to fearlessly communicate up chain to me that, hey, sir, I see a little different and I'm okay with it. I will listen. That's kind of hard, right? A lot of times somebody will say, especially the junior... Uh, personnel, uh, junior leaders will say, do this, da 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 and they'll come back saying, hey, sure, I'm not so sure we're doing it. What do you mean we can't do it? I told you to do it. Just do it. Be careful about that. Listen to, okay, tell me why you don't think it's something changed, and then you'll find out that you know something may have changed, and then you're like, okay, all right. Which leads to my third thing. Let the situation dictate the strategy. If the situation changes, you may have to revisit the strategy, and that's what your people will look at. That's that individual coming up to you saying, Hey, sir, I don't think we can execute that plan because, you know, uh, because of whatever. And you're like, okay, let's take a look, bring everybody to bear, and figure out, okay, do this, this initial condition change? Do we need to change uh, uh, our strategy? Uh, and so uh, having people think that way, in my opinion, has led me to where I am today um, because I, I'm a very flat organization. I do not like micromanaging. I trust that they will do uh, do their job or ask for help uh, if they need it. Uh, and it's, it's worked well this far. I'm a little I'm a little kid from Vallejo who's now a rear admiral in the United States Navy. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep using this. But I I, I hope uh, you saw the difference between when I was a junior officer, really right next to my people who were doing the work to the higher strategic level of my people doing their thing because I'm on all these meetings with the secretary and the CNO and all these other assistant secretaries uh, that I need to be able to trust them and then they will come tell me when they need my help. Great question. My cadets is interested in the uh, Space Force. Awesome. Do you have a relationship with that department? Any knowledge of that department? So, you know what? I totally meant to mention this at Vanden. I totally forgot. So, uh, yes. So, uh, uh, 
one, I could walk down the hall uh, and talk, uh, talk about the Space Force and send you some things. Uh, if we can get his email, Tiki. Uh, but uh, if you get the email, we can send some things to him about the Space Force. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Just for it. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Oh, thank you. So the, uh, but here's the connection. So I'm sorry, I remember I said, hey, I want people who can think out of the box. I don't want someone who just cookie cutter, hey, this is what we're gonna do, because we've always done this way. Uh -uh. We need to innovate to be better than our adversaries. So I take over something you've said, and, and quite honestly, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, let's see, my three-star boss is underway. I'm like the senior guy here, rock on. So I am working with the Air Force and the Space Force to figure out how to do targeting from space-based assets to an Air Force B-1 bomber targeted by a submarine. Because what I found out at MC Work Mining Development Center is when an Air Force was developing and, and, and had delivered uh, by, uh, by 2020, a super cavitating joint direct uh, uh, armed munitions, so what does that mean, super captaining? It can hit something under the water. That was their goal from a B-1. Uh, and so how does that occur? I was like, man, they had this, and the, I, quite honestly, I had no idea how the Air Force was gonna target a submarine under the water to try to hit it with one of these things. And so I had this idea uh, when I was in Japan that, hey, let's go work with Indo-PACOM and get the uh, Pacific Air Force uh, and, uh, the uh, space-based ISR to figure out this targeting piece. Uh, that way we can proof a concept and do uh, more uh, uh, tactics development uh, with this kill chain. Because in, in I, I wanted as many kill chains as possible against the capacity of the PRC submarine force. Uh, and so I had the USS Province who went under ice to get to end the PACOM. So we wanted a proof of concept of, hey, I want to deploy on a submarine response plan as a boat from the East Coast over to Seven Fleet Waters. So we were able to do that with the Providence. And then I, I told the Providence, okay, hey, look, I want, to, I, I want you to simulate uh, a track in a submarine. And we timed it with Space Base ISR uh, and the B-1 bomber. And, and what was tricky was having the Providence provide targeting data to the B-1. Uh, we were trying to use, I mean, quite honestly, we were trying to use space, but it was taking too long. So by the time, you know, because we, uh, what was happening is, based on the time delay, uh, your area of uncertainty of that target grows. And space space, we can flow it, but it went through the night. Naval Integrated Fires Element in Colorado, and then back to Indo-PACOM to the B-1. It was taking too long, so by the time they got the targeting data, they said, hey, the air uncertainty is too large for the super cavitating data. Good thing is, we figured that out, right? Mm -hmm. So now, uh, the next iteration would be, hey, try to tighten that kill chain if we had to do space space. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we provided data to the B-1 via Indo-PACOM and, and PAC Air Force, Pacific Air Force, to where, uh, to where the target was, so that when, and the Providence would be pinging, pinging, pinging on the link to gain contact on the B-1 and then pass targeting data to the B-1. When we figured that out, uh, it was quicker to get an updated targeting solution to then launch a super capitating, super capitating J down from a B-1. So that ties in the Air Force and, and the, the Space Force. But again, it was the, when I told my team, hey, this is what I wanted to do, they're like, oh, game on, sir. And they're the ones who figured out the logistics on how to get it done but with the iteration of we use space first, takes too long, and then as the B1s come in, hey, why don't we just try to go straight to Link 16? That was our secondary uh, course of action, and that's the one that ended up working. Uh, so there is connective tissue in the joint warfighting concept with SpaceCom, uh, the Air Force, Indo-PACOM, all the combatant commands, uh, and SpaceCom writ large is on it touches all of them because of the, the space-based things. A lot of capability there. Next question. Yes. How did you motivate yourself through difficult situations? So, uh, when I was a junior officer, uh, again, I'm gonna be real in this one. When I was a junior officer, uh, we went through some tough times. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I was single. Uh, so I would remind myself uh, that, look, uh, you know, and this is just me talking to myself. Hey, look, uh, I am not going to be defeated through the tough times, whether it be in the shipyard, you know, on mission, like really tired. Because everybody knows back in the day, you stood watch back, you know, back in the engine room for six hours. Then you stood another watch up forward for six hours. So you're up 12 hours. And oh, by the way, you're supposed to get six hours off for sleep before you start that cycle again. Well, what happens? Training and maintenance. Mm -hmm. So that six hours become two hours. So you get a two hour nap and then you start that whole cycle again. Very hard. Uh, but uh, uh, I would tell myself, hey, I am stronger than this. I am not going to be defeated. I'm not going to let it bring me down. I'm going to persevere and persist. Why? Because that's who I am. So I, so I never gave up. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it's, it got a lot easier, to be honest with you. So it is self-motivation for me. Uh, I knew that I'm better than this. I didn't uh, want to ever give in, no matter how tough it got. Uh, and I, I started, uh, towards the end of my junior officer tour, I started dating my current wife, Lonnie. And uh, I tell you, I, I didn't know how she would take it when I have to call her and go, hey, I know we're supposed to go out tonight, but I can't, I'm stuck on the boat. So I had to do some stuff uh, for the engineer. Uh, but she was good with it. Uh, and, and luckily she married, we were still married now, but uh, after I was married and had a family, uh, quite honestly, during the tough times, all I thought about is, hey, all I have to do is get through this piece, and then I get to go home safely to my wonderful family. So that's what got me through. I'm very, you know, I, I think, if you ask my staff, I'm kind of the same way now. It's like, are you done with work? Hey, I'm good. If something blows up, hey, look, they're just gonna power through this, and I'm gonna talk to the secretary, I'm gonna talk to the CNO, uh, get a good site picture, and then I'm gonna bounce and go home. You know, I'm not gonna keep people around just to churn on some stuff. We'll figure it out in the morning. Uh, and so I'm very grounded. Uh, and it, I'll be honest with you, I think it goes back to my humble beginnings here in Vallejo. I'm just a kid from Vallejo, from the wrong side of Vallejo. And so I, I, you know, I'm amazed when I go into the Pentagon and I see Chief of Legislative Affairs, I'm like, who is that guy? Oh crap, it's me. And then I go in to see the Secretary of the Navy. He's Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations. And I'm a kid from Vallejo. That's what amazes me about this and it keeps me grounded and so I, I you guys figured out, figured out why I can only spin up. Because uh, what's the point? It's wasted energy. And so that's how I hope that, uh, uh, I hope that answers hey, how I got through all the situations. Because the submariners will know there's a lot of stressful situations at sea uh, that you have to deal with and just power through it. And that's one of the things that I think my commands loved about me is I'm very level headed. And it's like, hey, let's do this. Like, that makes perfect sense. I just see that. Well, we've done it. Is when you can stay calm through all the chaff that's coming in, you can the, the, the right decision comes to you very quickly. If you get all emotional with everything and, and it clouds your judgment, I think. Uh, it's, sir, what was your biggest adversity and how did you conquer it? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, there's a lot of them, but one of the things that really shook me to my core uh, was when I was department head and my commanding officer. Uh, who, who wasn't the nicest guy, very smart. He was a commanding officer, new power submarine, very smart. Uh, but he had a different way of leadership than me. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, I would always take what I call center of mass. If one of my guys screwed something up, I would go to the captain and I would tell him. I wouldn't let the officer of the deck, who's normally the guy who told the captain that things, I would, I said, officer of the deck, this is what happened, da 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 da, so we can't execute this plan. I will tell the captain to like tell the answer. So I go to the captain and say, hey, sir. And I'd say it this way, Captain, sir, I'm here to report that I screwed this up. Uh, you know, I failed this test, da 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 whatever, and now it's gonna throw off our timing. Uh, the captain didn't take that well. The captain did not like that. He was like, that. He goes, why did you screw it up? And, and just blah, 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 blah. Uh, but every time we did something wrong, uh, I'd go in and say, sir, I screwed this up. This is, this is da 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 uh, he finally realized that, okay, in his mind, this is what my exo told me, that, hey, you're covering for your guys, don't do that. Go, what are you talking about? He goes, tell them who screwed it up. I'm like, no, that's not my job. My job is to execute the mission. Uh, it doesn't matter who screwed it up. It's my, it's my department, so I screwed it up. 
And I'm not gonna let the captain go to my guys and, and yell at them and check the captain's mask or whatever it was. Uh, and so I continued that. And finally, you know, the captain realized that, okay, uh, uh, I'm gonna back off uh, because hey, he, the, the engineer uh, is not going to sell out his guys. Uh, he asked a lot of questions, but in the end, so the, the, the hard part was the fact that I have a commanding officer who is basically in charge of my career because he writes the fitness reports on me uh, that uh, repeatedly told me that uh, you know, I, I wasn't mean enough, I wasn't strong enough to run my department, and he wasn't sure that I would make it. That was my captain. Uh, so, and he won. My XO, all, he to, all my XO told me was, X, Ange, why don't you just do what the captain says? And then he'll know that, uh, hey, you are tough enough to be the engineer. I'm like, it's not about being tough, XO. It's about leading. And I, that's not me. My opinion is if I tried that, my people would know that I was faking it. That, hey, that's not Lieutenant Commander Delaga. We don't know who this guy is. And then I would lose, they would lose faith with me because I'm not being myself. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, uh, after that patrol, uh, we did very well on my engineering inspection line. Very, very well. Uh, that's why I went and worked for the four star after that. Uh, and then my captain realized that, okay, maybe my engineer does know what he's doing. And uh, I don't wanna say I became his favorite, but that's what everybody else said. Uh, but it was tough because I got to figure out, you know, how am I going to push back to my captain or do I just give in and do what he says, even though it's not my nature. And I picked uh, the former with respect to staying true to who I am, not trying to be someone else and pushing back uh, to my commanding officer tactfully, uh, but taking it center of mass when he was pushing stuff downhill, trying to get me to do something I didn't want. Yeah, so that was uh, that was tough. Quite honestly, the tactics, I loved it. Tactics and stuff was easy. Mission was stressful, but very rewarding. But leadership-wise, that was the toughest thing I had to deal with.